Progressive revelation is an important principle of Bible interpretation. It states that doctrines introduced in an early portion of the Bible unfold more fully later on. That God reveals his will in successive stages, building upon but never contradicting previous truths. But in the case of the passage that I've chosen for our study today, this process is reversed. Our text is Psalm 37, and I encourage you to turn there if you have a Bible handy. One of the verses we will look at here was quoted by Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount. This greatest of sermons contains the most transformative and radical teachings in the history of the world, especially the nine pronouncements that we call the Beatitudes. When Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, he was quoting Psalm 37, 11. Quoting, you'll understand, but not explaining. Now that's okay, because the psalm before us is all about the meekness that Christ was calling for. Meekness can be defined as a humble attitude that expresses itself in the patient endurance of offenses. It is a, a gentleness that implies mercy and self-restraint. Now, meekness isn't weakness in any way, shape, or form. Weak people can't do anything, while meek people can, but choose not to because they have a greater purpose and are following God's plan. The word was often used to describe controlling a stallion with bit and bridle. Thus, meekness isn't weakness, it's strength under control. Now, before we look at this exposition of Christ's words, given a thousand years before he spoke them, let's take a moment to ask the Lord for the insight that we always need and he always provides. Father God, thank you that we can come before you in Jesus' name. Thank you for another wonderful psalm. Thank you for the Old Testament and the New Testament, both equally and fully inspired. Thank you for the opportunity to learn what you have for us. And I pray that you'd help us to be a relevant study, a powerful study, an encouraging study, all of these we pray as we would take your word at its word, as we would see what you have for us and allow you to change us as a result. Father, we ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, be aware, please, that David, the human author of the 37th Psalm, wrote late in his life. So these are the words of a wise and mature man. Reflecting on a lifetime of observing both the wicked and the righteous, David gives us this important message. Write it down. Verses 1 and 2. God expects his children to remain calm and faithful even when the wicked are prospering in society, often at our expense. It was a problem then. It's a problem today. It's always been a problem. It always will until we are taken to glory to be with Jesus. That's why David says and repeats two more times this phrase, do not fret, verse 1, verse 7, and verse 8, do not fret. Here is verse 1 as we begin our study. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Now, don't fret means don't burn with anger. Don't get overheated. Don't get worked up. Don't lose your cool. You know you're losing it when you respond with emotions of anger and jealousy. So, he opens this up, expands this more by saying, don't be angry about the evildoer's presence. Righteous indignation is a legitimate response when sin is abounding and sinful people are triumphing in society. But there's nothing righteous about the type of anger suggested here. You see, a meek person would never fly off the handle when confronting evil because the fruit of the Spirit includes self-control. The Bible tells us not all anger is sinful, but all anger can become sinful if we dwell on it, if we let it poison our heart, or if we start responding in our own strength to what is obviously a spiritual problem. Paul warns about letting the sun go down on our wrath and thereby giving the devil an opportunity that he would not have otherwise. That's in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Elsewhere, God's word instructs us to let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you, along with all malice, because man's wrath does not produce the righteousness of God. That couldn't be any clearer. Don't be angry about the evildoer's presence. Do not fret because of evildoers. Secondly, don't envy the evildoer's prosperity. 
that's the second part here of the first verse that we saw, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Unfortunately, God's people can get so upset with the success of the wicked that they actually become somewhat jealous of how they're doing, of their prosperity. We do right and suffer for it, while the godless live as they please and not only get away with it, but are praised and commended by their peers and the elites who run everything. They get awards. They have things named after them. And all they're doing is sinning, sinning with impunity. Fret not, brother. The prosperity of the wicked is an illusion that will come crashing down sooner than they realize. Because that's the message of verse 2. For, he says, don't fret, because they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Natural man foolishly believes that he is secure and unassailable. He has all the, the uh, things, uh, levels, uh, levers of power working for him. He has the media. He has the, um, the science community. Maybe all the things, everybody is agreeing with natural man against God, and he thinks he's secure, and he thinks that nothing can stop him. He's wrong, because the Bible says that God has already placed him on slippery ground. That's Psalm 73, 13. God has placed them in slippery places. Soon, according to God's schedule, the wicked will be cut down like blades of grass on a lawn, overdue, a lawn that's overdue for mowing. This is David's message. This is the what of Psalm 37. Remain cool, even though evil people are prospering. But he realizes how hard this is to do, and so the rest of the section gives us the how for the what, as David reveals the means to the message. The message is clear. The means to the message is verses 3 through 11. And here's, here it is. In a nutshell, when you can't change the problems... You can always change your perspective. When you can't change the situation, you can, you can change how you look at it. Losing your cool demonstrates that you are looking in the wrong place. Every time you lose it, every time, Christian, that you get upset to the point of boiling over, that area is an area where you aren't fully trusting God. And your reaction, your emotional response, proves it. So rather than focusing on the wicked around you, he says, keep your eyes on the Father. That's in verses 3 through 8. Keep your eyes on the Father. Stop looking around and start looking up. There are five commands given here. And I, I love this section of the 37th Psalm. It's why I chose this text today. It's one of my favorite psalms because there's this list of things that we can do and that God will help us to that will make a real difference in real time for real saints. Five commands are given here. Each one is connected to the Lord in heaven. Here's the first one. Trust in the Lord. This is found in verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. You can't depend on man, his institution, his, his, his systems, his ideas. There is no lasting political, legislative, or judicial solution to man's problems. We need to trust in God. Because faith is the starting point of our relationship with him. It's also the only way to live each day after we become part of his family. Without faith, as we say often here from Hebrews 11, it's impossible to please God. But because genuine faith is always active, the psalmist tells us to trust in the Lord and do good. And do good. Even if... Uh, to the very ones who are bothering us with their evil in the first place. You know, Jesus taught this um, later in the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. And so the idea is not that we would retreat and withdraw, that we would build a moat around our house, around our church, but that rather we would continue to do what God wants us to do, but we will trust in him as we go. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul tells us that we should pray for people rather than railing against them. So that, 2 Timothy 2 says, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. David is just preemptively agreeing with the Apostle with the tail end of verse 3 in the 37th Psalm when he says, as we read, dwell in the land and feed on his, God's, faithfulness. We will be able to live the life that God wants us to live 
if we are truly trusting in him. The second thing is to delight yourself in the Lord, and that's in verse 4. Now, although unbelievers view God as harsh, angry, and a cosmic killjoy, believers know better. Our relationship with Jesus is sweet, and it's getting sweeter as the days go by. Yes, he is holy and never lowers his standards, but he is also meek and gentle of heart. He says, come learn of me, and we have learned, we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, haven't we? And so we are able to see him as loving, gracious, and kind. Knowing this, we can easily obey, obey the next command, then, verse 4, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, delight speaks of spending life enjoying a relationship with someone. And this is really an apt description of the intimate relationship that we share with God. Psalm 73 says, Whom I have, I have I in heaven but you? And there's no one I desire on earth but you. We cherish him above all others. We desire his presence as a deer thirsts for streams of water. That's another psalm, Psalm 42 and verse 1. He is altogether lovely. He is precious to us. You know, only a believer talks that way. Only a believer gets this. But every believer does. Because, you know, we have a relationship with God. We pray differently. There's people that have a, a moment of silence, so they mumble words, or they learn some, something in catechism. But when you're really talking to a Father in heaven with whom you have a relationship through Christ, you talk differently. It's an intimate and it's a wonderful walk and talk with him every single day of your life. So when we see God in this way, he says here, he rewards us by giving us the desire of our heart. Now don't make that a name it, claim it thing. He's not talking about things on a prayer list. I believe he's saying here, if your desire is me, then when you delight in me, I will give you <laughs> what you want. God himself becomes more real to us, sweeter even than the day before. Delight yourself in the Lord becomes the second thing after we trust in the Lord. There's a third one. Commit your way to the Lord. Now, it's related, of course, commit and trust, but they're different. Commit translates a Hebrew word that means to roll onto. So committing our path to the Lord is transferring everything in our life from our shoulders to his. Look at verses 5 and 6. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noon day. When facing chaos, Christian, don't give in, don't give up, but rather give over. Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. Peter wrote that, 1 Peter 5, 7. I, I think he probably had Psalm 37 in mind when he did so. Recognize that God has everything firmly under his control, so once you transfer the burden from yourself to him, you can walk away relieved, relaxed, and refreshed. It says here, he will, categorically, undeniably, ultimately, he promises he will bring everything to pass. He will, he will validate your decision. Listen, he will validate your decision to commit your way unto him. Ultimately, he will display your righteousness and grant your justice as the noonday. Do you have that assurance today, friend? David did. Paul did. I love this verse from the New Testament, um, 2 Timothy 1.12, where Paul says, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Isn't that great? I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him against that until that day. Amen, David. Amen, Paul. It's the same thing for me. I hope it is for you, my friend. Here's the fourth responsibility, also talking about the Lord, and it's found in verse 7. Rest in the Lord. Rest and trust in the Lord in verse 3. Delight yourself in the Lord in verse 4. Commit your way to the Lord in verse 5 and 6. Rest in the Lord and in verse 7. Here's that verse. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. 
Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Rest means to be still. But don't mistake resting for rusting, because there's nothing passive about the decision to let go and let God. Resting involves a cessation of activity in your own strength or with your own wisdom. It is leaning not unto your own understanding, but rather acknowledging Him in all your ways. The same Hebrew word translated rest in Psalm 37, 7 is translated still in the account of God's deliverance in Joshua's day when the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. The sun standing still, still, standing still, is the same word, resting. And so what we're doing when we rest in the Lord, we are standing still, stopping our struggling, choosing rather to wait patiently for the Lord for the next thing that he has for us. As a result, we can stop fussing and fuming about those who prosper in their wicked ways and schemes, the verse says. You see, because God is fighting our battles for us, these people aren't our responsibility anymore. In fact, they never really were. Stop worrying. Stop trying to live life on your own. Stop comparing your lot with someone else. Stop agonizing over societal wickedness. Be still and know that he is God. He will be exalted among the nations. Yea, he will be exalted in all the earth. And that one is Psalm 42 and verse 10. Four responsibilities here as we obey what God has given to us and as we follow the means, looking to the Father instead of to the things around us. There's one more. Refrain from anger against the Lord. Here's verse 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret and only causes harm. Now the anger in this verse is a quick-tempered and a hot-tempered rage. It's a fury. And it's something that should never characterize a child of God. It is almost certainly directed at the Lord here for allowing the things to be as they are. But whether it's against God or against those who are doing wrong and getting away with it, a meek person, a truly meek person, will forsake this response every time because it's beneath him. It is not worthy of her as Christ followers who have the example of Jesus who called himself meek and lowly of heart. So we need to keep our eyes on the Father the means to the message, the how for the what, is to keep your eyes on the Father and then to keep your eyes on the future. We've not reached the end yet, folks. It's amazing how many people are closing their books and like everything is done. No, the final accounting has not yet been made. God's word guarantees that those who do evil today will flourish only for a time, while the people of God will be preserved now and delivered later, delivered eternally, forever and ever. And this is the truth of the concluding three verses. Here's 9, 10, and 11. For, because evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. And there is that... Uh, beatitude, that place that Jesus quoted in the Gospels. Two des different destinations are described here. The wicked will be cut off from the earth. Cut off describes something that is completely cut down and destroyed. It's the same word used in Genesis to describe God's judgment by water on mankind. When it says there, uh, all flesh was cut off by the waters of the flood. Genesis chapter 9 verse 11. After that judgment, the devastation was total. With the exception of those in the ark, all traces of life were wiped off the planet. Gone. So to the coming judgment, this time with fire, will leave no trace of wickedness behind either. As verse 10 concludes, And you will look carefully for the wicked man's place, but it shall be no more. The wicked will be cut off cut down, removed. 
in the new heavens and the new earth. There will be no sin. There will be no iniquity, no wickedness. The devil and his demons and all those who are not, tri not trusted in Christ will be removed and will be in eternal judgment. So shall it be for the rest of eternity. It's interesting that Psalm 37 and Psalm 73 are companion psalms. They just switch the numbers there and they both talk about the same thing. And I've, I've always read one with the other and benefited from doing that. Can I read you some verses from the 73rd Psalm that fit in so well with this? Here's seven, it's a fairly lengthy, but hang with me, will you? This is Psalm 73, God's Word. I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace, Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and they speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. Here's the conclusion. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful, me until, too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. It's a change in perspective, folks that will make you able to live a life of calm in the chaos, that will allow you to be meek, even though things around you are a mess. We are to look to the Father, and we are to look to the future. The wicked will be cut off from the earth, but the righteous, as we read, will inherit the earth. We will rule with Christ over his eternal kingdom. A time when we will, it says here in, in, in Psalm 37, delight ourselves in the abundance of peace. Oh, I can't wait for that time, can you? If you're a child of God, don't you hanker for that? Hanker for heaven? Don't you want to be with the Lord? Don't you say, even so, come quickly, Lord, the older I get. The more I say that and the more I want that. But you don't have to be old to want that. A child of God who knows what is to come wants it. Wants it with all his heart. He's glad to remain here with the wonderful life God's given us, preserving us in the midst of chaos, and sharing our faith with others because we don't want to be selfish with what God has given to us. God's left us here for a reason, to share the truth with as many others as we can so they can come to Christ and join us in paradise one day. But oh, how we groan. Romans 8 says we groan inwardly for the coming of Christ, for the resurrection of the body, for the finish of the whole thing as he completes in us the work that he has begun. But so even in this life, friend, those who belong to Christ have a deep abiding peace, a calm that allows us to remain cool no matter what, uh, given as a gift by Jesus before he ascended to heaven. Here's what he promised in John 14, 27, peace. I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We have a peace that the world didn't give us, so the world can't take away. And this peace will grow only deeper and more abundant as the day approaches when Jesus, the Prince of Peace, will sit on David's throne. Oh, yes, another wonderful psalm, another wonder, encourage, wonderful encouragement to us. Brother and sister, you can remain calm in the chaos as you stop looking around so much and instead look up. Look to the Father. Look to the future that he has in store for you. Oh, I pray that Psalm 37 will be a blessing to you as it has always been to me. We just looked at the first few verses. Take some time. Read the entire thing. Memorize it, folks. This will make a difference today and every day until God calls you home. We close our study today with the prayer that you would indeed come to Christ and that he would bless you then uh, abundantly. And we'll hope to see you again next time.